Ladies and gentlemen, live from the Dolby Theater on Hollywood and Highland, please welcome CTO, Oculus, John Carmack. All right, so I've been doing keynotes for a long time, and I can really say without any exaggeration that I am more excited to be here today, this year, than I have ever been at anywhere else that I've done. <laughs> So I spent a lot of time yesterday talking to people in the hallways, and I was just biting my tongue over so many of the things that we got to announce today that are really important. So, I mean, we've only got an hour here today on this talk, but I will be around the rest of the day and tomorrow, and I'm here, to, here for everyone. So, I mean, my talks are so unfair to everybody else here where they've spent weeks kind of just trying to craft the perfect keynote, agonizing over every word, and I get to just kind of get up here and ramble on for a while. But I... <laughs> And I apologize ahead of time to the marketing and PR people for as I inevitably wander off message here. So anyways, let's talk about virtual reality. There's so much to talk about and so much going on. So one of the, the things that really is clear now is the value that we bring in virtual reality is when we can make the world inside the headset better than the world outside the headset. And you know, it's really straightforward there, but it has some interesting connotations to it. Of course, if you have the perfect life and your environment is exactly as you would, you know, would want it to be in your wildest imagination, virtual reality won't actually help much. But for a lot of people, you know, for almost everyone, there is this gap where we would prefer our environment to be different than what it is and whatever our current surroundings are. So the value there is going to be a function of the content that we have filtered by the limitations of our hardware. And that's kind of an interesting question to ask, is what the relative uh, merits and demerits of those two factors are. And I would say that if you had a magic wand and you could say, I will create the perfect virtual reality headset that completely solves all the problems and it is indistinguishable from reality, uh, would that be a super successful product with uh, kind of like the, the content that exists at this instant? And it would get lots of buys of people just trying to look at it and being excited by it, but you would run out of things to do fairly quickly. On the other hand, if I had the magic wand and I could say, I want the perfect content for the hardware that exists today, that would be a phenomenal product that could go ahead and just it would be incredible because you see flashes of brilliance and kind of signs of the future in the things that we've got right now, but they're isolated because we have, it's so sparse. You can see something and say, that was really awesome. That was the moment there. If we had so much more of that, or I had a great experience there, but now it's done. What do I go on to next? So it's been clear to me uh, over the last, the course of the last year that content really is the thing that needs the most efforts from us. And it wasn't as clear a year ago. Uh, when I talked last year, there was a whole lot of talk about exactly what the limitations are and the mitigation strategies for the hardware side of things. You know, what can we do about 60 frames per second, low persistence, what can we do about position tracking, some of these other areas. And we still need to address all of these things. These are all things that will get better, and every piece of content will magically get better as we address some of these hardware things. But it turns out that lots of people are having a great time with the existing content and the existing hardware. So I did make a fairly conscious decision for most of this last year to spend more of it chasing things that can impact the, uh, the content side of things. So uh, game development is still what most people kind of associate with virtual reality. And while I have the personal opinion that gaming will be somewhat less than half of the virtual reality market when it's mature, it's clearly the leading kind of the, the sharp end of the spear right now that's getting people excited and enthusiastic about it. And one of the problems is that game development is a very, very hard field. It's mature, we understand how to do it, and people spend you know, everybody knows what a $50 million budget game looks like. And to some degree, consciously or unconsciously, every game is judged against standards that have human waves of power behind them. And you just can't build a game for VR like that today. It doesn't make sense on any level. It takes too long. The economics don't work out. 
So you have to wind up being a lot smarter about how you do the development. As o you know, at Oculus, there's not a whole lot we can do that makes game development easier. There's already hundreds of really brilliant engineers working at Epic and uh, Unity to make game development easier. That's the job of all of these people that have been doing it for decades. And again, it's mature. We understand the problems. There's lots of people making it better. It'll get better whether Oculus is here or not. All that we can do on the game side, really, is try to make it so that developing a virtual reality application is no harder than developing a conventional game. And a lot of effort goes into our integrations and our SDKs and things like that. But making games is still unquestionably really hard. So one of the things that I did this last year was judging a lot of the VR Jam entries. And I thought that was really good for me to go ahead and plow through I, 50, 60 entries and look at what everybody was doing. And there are some tactics and techniques that I think are valuable to extract from that, where a lot of these were done in very short time, you know, a few months, small number of people. It was always clear looking at the visuals that these don't have massive amounts of manpower behind it. Uh, some were done very stylishly, and that played very much in their favor. But one of the things that stood out significantly to me was how even these short jam entries, some of them had really good audio. And there's a lot to be said for, in gameplay, having an audio system where, you've, especially if you've got headphones on, you can say, this sounds as good as anything that I would hear anywhere. Uh, voice acting is not necessarily so, uh, so exotic, hard to get into a game. If you get the right person there, your voice acting can sound as good, barring celebrities, as just about anybody's. And I noticed that on at least a half dozen uh, entries where I specifically commented that the audio was rich and it felt it added so much to the experience. And especially now with the positional audio support where that gives you that kind of VR magic feel when something moves around and you track it around audio-wise. So that's one of my pieces of advice to, to game developers is lean harder on the audio. I am super happy that uh, the final Rift does ship with the built-in audio, built-in headphones. That was you know, a point of debate for a while on whether that was going to be the case. But if we want to make audio significant and important, we have to make sure that, that most people wind up using it. You know, I still have, I wish that there was a solution that we had on Gear VR that completely integrated that, but we don't have a great plan for that right now. So we assume people will have headphones, and if they're playing a significant game or experience, that they'll put them in. But that's still one of those kind of gaps where we're not as perfect as we'd like to be for that. Um, you know, another situation is animation that I think is highly underutilized in game development for VR. One of the problems is that we've built a lot of VR games where you've got a tabletop experience, and you've got your little toys moving around in front of you. There's value to that approach in that it's super comfortable, everybody understands it, it's just like playing with the toys in your toy box. But one of the problems is, is that everything is so small. You're looking at it and you often don't appreciate all of the, the artistry that goes into a lot of the animations. When it's something small happening, it may be smeared into a small number of pixels or not in the center of your focus. And this, it's always a tragedy in the game development industry how much effort and art artistry goes into media content that's not fully appreciated. You see it in all of the games that have these wondrous rooms and creations and things like that, that you plow through in the game, you shoot something, you hit the switch, you move on to the next room, and you never go back and see it. But when you stand around in that room, especially in VR, you get to appreciate it so much more. So animation is something that... I want to see much more big in-your-face sorts of things where you get to see something that's occupying uh, the, th the stereoscopic sweet spot and it's large enough to be drawing your attention and making you focus on it. And that's something that we have a great potential to do in virtual reality where one of the neat things is that everybody's used to looking at animation in film and TV, which is usually 24 or 30 frames per second. And 60 or 90 frames per second animation has that, uh, that much more immediate real feel of things. And getting it sort of scaled up and in this sense where you feel like you're really looking at something is valuable. And we don't see a lot of that in our, our current games. Playing with it on the tabletop is neat, but one of the core lessons from first-person games all the way back to Wolfenstein was that Taking a game that you look at and you look at the small characters down there, it becomes so much more powerful when you are inside it and they're happening at your scale. 
I always said that Wolfenstein 3D was basically just gauntlet with a new perspective. You know, it's traditional kind of gaming style interactions. If you looked at it from the top view, it would look very much like that. But putting you inside it makes a real difference. So getting more of the virtual reality aspects in gaming happening kind of up and around you, that's going to be more powerful. The games will be fun, the tabletop things, there's going to be a rich set of things to be doing there. But I think it's less likely that when we look back five years from now, that people will have those experiences burned into their memories as the things that they dearly remember from the early days of VR, as much as the ones where you look around a corner and something jumps out at you, or you, know, you, you turn around and something is covering that whole view, or it comes up and interposes itself between you and whatever you're looking at. And those are the things that, that kind of make an impact and stick with you. So I... Uh, in fact, one of the things that I think is already, I, I found it very noteworthy that I have from some particular games, well, specifically from Minecraft, the time that I spent working on Minecraft in VR, I have memories of being in that game. And that's noteworthy. I mean, everybody has memories of playing games, but I have memories of actually being inside there, about coming up to a shoreline or being lost deep underground, running low on supplies, and that sense of being there. And as far as my brain's concerned, that was something that happened to me, and I was there. So I think that the, the first-person aspect of things about exploring and being inside worlds rather than the more restricted tabletop space or just in front of you space is the thing that will deliver more powerful emotional experiences. So uh, one of the keys to that, and that's still, uh, I've joked about this for a long time, but I'm completely serious about it now, that one of the core advantages to Gear VR is swivel chair gameplay. That, you know, it sounds like a, a funny ha-ha thing, but the difference between playing a game and using one of the many yaw turning approximations that we have. You can do snap turn, you can do blink turns, you can do uh, a couple other different things to try to do this yawing motion that everybody's used to with the game controllers, but really destroys a lot of the virtual reality sense of things. Uh, you get to that sense where if you're playing with snap turns, it's back to you are controlling your game character. You may be highly skilled at that, just like watching anybody that's super skilled in an FPS with a game controller. It's amazing how accurate and uh, how powerful that they can be with this relatively crude game interface, but it's actually fighting against the sense of immersion. So you can play a VR game with snap yaw turn, running around, snapping around, and you may get very skilled and good at it, but that is destroying the sense of presence. That never happens in reality, that you know, the, the world kind of snaps around you to turn. And the standard slow yaw turning is one of the very worst possible things for comfort, and that also never happens to you in reality. But contrary-wise, if you have a game where you can be standing up and you, you say, well, I want to go to my left, you turn to the left and you go forward. And you can't walk uh, without eventually running into something in the real world, but an instantaneous acceleration, that's one less thing that your brain has to just kind of forgive for the experiment. You can go ahead and turn in the real world, either standing or safer in a, sw in a swivel chair where you can sit down and turn around. And if you're just moving sort of in the cardinal directions, that winds up being pretty okay. Because the thing that hurts people is the accelerations. You know, we have the, the cases where you're pulled along a curved path. And even there, it's a suggestion where we have, uh, I think I heard the stat recently that Temple Run VR is still the most started up VR application, which is almost completely the worst thing that you could do to someone in VR from a comfort standpoint, pulling them around curved corners. But it's still kind of neat and fun, and people are obviously deriving from some value from it because it keeps getting started back up. So. The ability to take that, that exploration of the world, which for me was always what I wanted from virtual reality. There's, there's something to be said for the, you know, you are on your virtual throne and something is happening to entertain you around there, but I want to explore the worlds. I want to see what's around the next corner. I want to go down the hall and around the bend and see what opens up and to have the magical vista revealed to me as I, you know, crest the top of a hill. These are the things that, that that really means something in VR. And I think that we can do this with swivel chair gameplay and Gear VR and the wireless play. So the, you know, we have a few exemplars of that, but for me, Minecraft really was uh, 
Well, Minecraft was my quest, really, for the last year and a half. Uh, before Gear VR even existed, Minecraft was something that I was desperate to get into virtual reality because I thought it would be critically important. One aspect of it was just purely technical, where uh, you know, the story of Minecraft is that it was originally a Java application, that's the high-end SKU, but they developed the Pocket Edition code base as basically a brand new from scratch C++ implementation that was initially very feature limited, but it's working to catch up. And uh, of course, my kids play Minecraft all the time, I play a little bit with them, and I would see it running on, uh, on portable devices, and I would think, okay, it's a, it's a native C++ code base. This was back in the early days of Gear VR before you know, we weren't, we didn't have any examples of Unity applications running very well yet. It was really, the only things running great were the C++ code that, uh, that I had started on the applications. So the idea of saying, taking a game that I know is implemented efficiently in C++, it should be a good target for this. It's, uh, it's a virtual world. There's a whole spiel you can get. Uh, I had made this observation independently, but somebody wrote a paper about it online, about the Minecraft metaverse, about how Minecraft already does embody so many of the things that, that people think about the metaverse, where it's infinite worlds, it's links between different servers, it's user-generated content, it's avatars and skinning, and all of these things that are, you know, that are there in this crude form, but they already exist. And putting that into VR was something that I, I thought was very, very important and you know, a worthy way to spend a lot of effort on it. And so the, there's a long story behind all of this where early on we had, uh, you know, we invited Notch over to Oculus and we showed him early prototype stuff and I talked with him about geeky programmer stuff for a long time. And we were, we were trying to get a situation where we just say, just let us give this a try on, uh, on this hardware. Let's just see how it works out. We don't have to tell anybody. Uh, and if it's great, then we'll see we'll, where we can go from there. So, I, you know, when Facebook acquired Oculus, Notch kind of famously blew up about it. And I eventually got over it and things uh, calmed down a bit. Then there was the Microsoft acquisition. So at that point, I had, uh, I had asked Notch, it's like, well, who should I talk to about this now? I still really, really want to make this happen. And he put me in touch with Tommaso and Jonas at Mojang, and I started pestering them about it. And I would just you know, drive home this case about, look, we don't want to ask anything from you. Just let us try. Let me, let me try to build this. And if you think it's cool, we'll figure out what we want to do from there. I am so confident that it'll be cool that I'll agree to, to just about anything here. And <laughs> And they said, uh, they actually gave me, a, they got me GitHub access to, or Git access to their repo uh, for the PE code base, but we signed a contract that our lawyers are like, this is terrible, they own everything you do, we have no recourse, there's no guarantee any of this will happen. John, you're basically working for Microsoft when you're, uh, when you're working on this. I'm like, it's okay, you know, we need to, we need to get the first thing, first thing going with this. So, I. Uh, you know, I did start running it up on Gear VR, and one of the things that was a little bit surprising for me is I had, I had thought that the performance of the game was a little bit higher than it actually was because I had only ever played it with a touchpad, and touch, kind of like a mouse, hides the frame rate a little bit because you never have the, the completely smooth yaw panning motions when you're just kind of swinging it around. So I felt that it was more 60 frames per second consistently across more things than, than it turned out it actually was, and performance became one of the really big challenges for it. Uh, when you play it with a joypad, and they had built, the thing that gave me a real leg, leg up on this is they had made a version for the Amazon Fire TV that supported the Amazon controller, so they had done most of the legwork of having some kind of a game controller letting you play Minecraft. And I'm hacking around with that, setting it up, and finding that when you actually look at it on a Fire TV, the frame rate is really pretty choppy because it's a lower-end ARM processor. But even on the Note 4, where I did the development work, it would have large ranges of performance, where you could be 60 frames per second in a tons of places, but you get into a deep forest canopy or something, and it could chug down pretty significantly from there. So a lot of the challenges were in performance, I, kind of getting it up to the point where, I, where it would run reasonably consistently. I mean, asynchronous time warp helps out a lot in the worst cases. It's better that it doesn't go into juddering when, when you do miss the frame rate, but it's still important to try to get the performance up as much as possible. Uh, the other 
obvious aspect about Minecraft is that it's made out of these giant nearest sampled alias pixels where I talk out, you can get me going about aliasing in virtual reality and how important it is to have much better filtering and control than you have on any conventional 2D game. But here we are with Minecraft, which it would be hard to do things in a more alias prone way where you do not have multi-sample anti-aliasing on and all of the textures are nearest sampled, so every pixel transition is an aliased line. They usually keep the contrast reasonably low, so it's not like they were all black-white checkerboards, but it really is pretty bad. And I would, I would start playing the game and say, oh my god, the aliasing, my eyes are going to bleed. But it was, it was really kind of startling how quickly I just said, okay, I'm in the game and I'm having fun and I've kind of passed that and it's not bothering me so much. It matters a lot for the first impression, but I played probably, I, play, I definitely played more hours of Minecraft in Gear VR than any other probably all the other Gear VR games that I've played put together, everything short of the video experiences. So I've logged a lot of hours in it, and I still want to fix all of those things. I've been going back and forth with, uh, you know, with some of their engineers about strategies that we could take to fix that. What do we need to do? We need to kind of add borders and gutters between the textures so that you can enable uh, multi-sample anti-aliasing. You need to have them scaled up so you can still have the traditional blocky look while still filtering between the pixels. These are all things that, you know, that can be fixed, but it turns out that I wouldn't say that they're at all necessary for an initial release of something because I have an immense amount of fun playing the game like that, even as it was. So the, the number one challenge really was first getting the frame rate good enough, making sure that the head tracking works right, getting the fundamentals of VR working. Because uh, there's, interestingly, when I started talking about this, Brendan uh, has, you know, Brendan is uh, significantly sensitive. He's one of the more sensitive people to uh, motion sickness. And by the way, Michael Abrash's little, uh, little jab about me being completely insensitive is not at all true. I actually, I am not the most sensitive person, but I have played Omega Agent almost to the point of feeling nauseous, uh, and Minecraft as well. So I'm not the, the most susceptible, but I'm not exactly immune, and I definitely tested that with some kind of marathon Minecraft sessions at times with this. But Brendan, of course, is super sensitive. And he had had a bad experience early on where there was the, uh, the modded Minecraft version that ran on DK1, and he had tried that and almost immediately got very, very ill from it. So when he was hearing that I'm working on Minecraft, that, I, that this is going to be really important for me and for, you know, for everything here, he was not super enthusiastic about, uh, about this. We have been messaging about comfort all the time at Oculus. And I've been you know, kind of waving the flag about, well, value's important even if it's not perfect comfort. Uh, but we had, I had my Minecraft on my Gear VR, and of course the magic of Gear VR is it's just in your backpack and you pull it out at one of our executive retreats. I was like, okay, I was showing it to a few people, set them down in the swivel chair, let them move around and play, and Palmer played for a while, and then, you know, we're, Brendan, let's give it a try. <laughs> you know, sit him down in the chair, and he's just very trepidatious, gets it on, slowly looks a little bit, and he moves around, and he show him, I show him how to fly around and hit some bricks, and he's playing for a while, and everybody else outside is kind of watching. We're kind of looking at our, our watches, checking our the phones, checking the time, and we're like whispering, Brendan's been in there for 20 minutes. And that's remarkable. And Brendan comes out of it smiling, saying, that was okay. And that was very interesting. And that was an important point for kind of the whole project direction there. After a while, Brendan was like, you know, I guess I should try it when I haven't had three glasses of wine after the, the meeting here to see if there's any correlation between any of that. But it's still not something where he's going to be the one bounding up and down hills. But it was a good enough experience that it's not an insta-sick, I uh, put on the headset and here is a lousy PR moment for Oculus sort of thing. Uh, and it continued on working the optimizations. The most important thing that this was another kind of funny internal Oculus bit where the performance was really not good enough to consistently be running stereoscopic for everything. So I had a little mode option where I could toggle between stereoscopic and monoscopic. And my thinking was that 
most of the time, you don't have things in that stereoscopic sweet spot. I have another technical argument that if you're going to have all of this aliasing, there's a good argument that aliasing is much worse in stereoscopic views because your eyes see every little jag on the pixels. If it doesn't have a matching jag in the other eye, which it won't because of the nature of integral rasterization, then your eye or your brain has to fight a little bit about those discontinuities there. But what I had done in it was set up a, uh, a special plane in time warp. And this is something that if some people that have been looking at carefully in the SDK headers six months ago may have noticed this overlay HUD layer that was available in time warp. And this is another thing where we come back to, we have guidelines, but you need to know when to break your guidelines. One of our guidelines has always been that you don't want to do face locked HUDs that it's kind of the lazy game design way in general to make a VR game where you just put all of your stats locked to your face there and it just moves around. So we think it's generally not optimal VR usage. You know, there's nothing in reality that sticks to your face like that, other than I guess your fuzzy glasses views. But the uh, putting game content up there, we, we generally feel detracts a little bit from the experience. But uh, Minecraft, I. Uh, I didn't have any other great ideas to do uh, how you select between your inventory down there and putting your health up there, and I, you need some kind of a crosshair in the middle. The sneaky trick that I did with this, though, I made a new time warp layer for it. So one aspect of face lock stuff that makes it especially bad is that if you do miss your frame rate, time warp can go ahead and fix up the angular view by assuming that the entire world is distant and turns at, the constant, at a constant rate relative to your head offset. But of course, if you've got something locked to your head, it winds up moving that as well. And it was very interesting listening to the Gunjack devs yesterday talk about how Time Warp was not a savior for them because they had heads-up elements, because they had to display some things locked to the face. And I did mention, I actually have a solution for that that I did for some other project that I can't talk about yet uh, that can solve that, that issue for them. So the trick is that you have Time Warp having one layer which for Minecraft is pleasantly low resolution, since that can be just sampled at the kind of pixely level, and then the world underneath it. So Time Warp will leave that HUD layer completely constant while letting you move the world around to make up frames. And even if you're at 60 frames per second, this is also useful because we do interpolated time warping because the raster video is scanned out incrementally. It's like eight milliseconds per eye. And we actually calculate where things should be based on that kind of shearing distance. So if you have HUD content there and you like look up and down, you'll actually see it sway a little bit if you're drawing it normally, even at 60 frames per second. But with the HUD layer there, you can go ahead and guarantee that that's locked. So it addresses the performance problem about the world, the, the HUD won't start juddering when asynchronous time warp is filling in one of your missed frames. But the sneaky thing that I did was set it up so that there was actually a depth offset between it. Instead of just being locked to the monoscopic view, I had the HUD element slightly shifted. So that meant that your floating elements and your crosshair cursor felt like they were nearer than the rest of the world. So the world was monoscopic. It was kind of at infinity. But the, uh, you know, the HUD and these elements, there was clearly stereoscopic disparity. And I had mentioned doing monoscopic as an optimization. And when Palmer was playing it, he was like, yeah, this is pretty good, but I wouldn't want to play it in monoscopic. I'm like, you've been playing it in monoscopic. You just didn't notice. <laughs> so occasionally, dirty tricks work out as, uh, you know, as good methods in software engineering. So uh, going forward with the project, it is now, it's, I guess I could say how close this came, where I got the email at 12.35 a.m. this morning that the deal was signed. We had gone through all of this preparation of uh, you know, preparing what are we going to, how are we going to announce this, assuming we get to announce this. And, uh, and it was really, really down to the wire because what had happened over the, you know, the eight months, six months since I had done the initial work for that, we were desperately trying to kind of reach a deal with Mojang about how we can do this that it's so it'll work out for everybody and i was willing to you know do just about anything on the phone i said if this if this doesn't happen i'm going to cry this is this will just be so terrible because this is amazing this is going to be the best thing that we can do for for the platform but you know in the end there are some problems that compilers can't solve and uh, it came down to kind of something at the the, C, uh, the ceo level where mark and satya uh, were able to sit down and make sure that uh, the deal actually happened and I have been 
you know, this, I call this my grail. This has been my quest for the last year and a half. I think it's one of the most important things. I think it's the single most important application that we can do for virtual reality to make sure that we have an army of fanatic, passionate supporters that will advocate why VR is great. This is why you want to do some of it every single day. It's part of this infinite playability that we're currently lacking in our current set of titles. So this was a huge, huge win for me. And I, uh, you know, everybody that worked on that at Oculus and Facebook, you know, you all have my, my deepest thanks for making this happen. Uh, thank you. So, but like I said at the beginning, I think that gaming is probably going to be somewhat less than half of the, the time that people spend in virtual reality. I think that, you know, we all can look at games that, you know, the PlayStation uh, 2 selling 100 million something units as a, a high watermark. There's a lot of people that love games, but there's even more people that like to watch, watch videos, look at photos. This is why, you know, Facebook has over a billion people using it, using it regularly, because there are these things that are not games that are very, very important parts of people's lives. So the media side of things is something that clearly it's having an impact already in virtual reality when we talk about the, uh, the panoramic videos, 360 videos, stereo videos. These were some of our important launch things. Generally, when you show somebody Gear VR for the first time, you put them in like VR Intro or Zarkana or one of the, one of the really well-produced uh, panoramic videos, because that's the thing. It doesn't require them to learn how to interact with anything. They can look around, and it's usually one of those jaw-dropping moments. We're all jaded now because we've all seen these things forever, but uh, when you put it on people's faces fresh, it usually is a very strong experience. And not everything has to be interactive. I mean, there are times when lots of people, for their entertainment, they want to sit back and, and consume the entertainment. I've always thought it's, you know, it's amusing how you see the streams with, uh, you know, things with Twitch and with, uh, with Minecraft especially, about how many people spend more time watching people play the games than playing the games themselves. There's definitely that aspect where it's important. So, We've done some good work with the media side of things, but there's a lot of things. And honestly, this is one of those areas that I, we're a little bit further behind than I wanted us to be. I think Samsung has done a nice job with Milk VR having a service where there is a reasonable amount of content that you can go and see. But we haven't done a great job on having background downloaders versus uh, streaming quality, which is still not as good as we'd want. And there's some real technical challenges involved with all that. I, a couple great things that are happening at the Facebook side of things, where we have Oculus people and we have Facebook, and there's bridges between them on some levels, but we have a team on the Facebook side of things working on uh, panoramic video for a couple different technical things. One aspect is putting the panoramic content into the Facebook timelines, getting it so that you can see panoramic content and then tilt the screen, look around at it. And I'm still of the opinion that in general, panoramic content on 2D screens is more of a gimmick than a deep value. There's some reasons why you want it in some places, but not a lot of people, especially mousing, will want to mouse over something and pan around and explore. It's a little bit neater doing it on the, the tilt screen, but the content really only comes into its own in virtual reality, where you can you know, pop in and see everything all around and explore. So, what we want to have soon is this ability to find content through Facebook, just kind of see it go by on your, on your timeline, and then be able to, say, view this in VR, and then go into VR, and then critically having the you might like sorts of links after that, where we need to replicate the, the things that happen with Facebook and YouTube, where you go and you watch something, and then the next thing you know, it's 45 minutes later, and you've watched 10 different videos just by clicking the thing that looks interesting after you finish that one. You know, we don't have that at all in VR, both because of limited content, and also we don't have the infrastructure for, for linking that together, mining what people might like to see. And that's a lot of work that needs to be done, but Facebook is the best company in the entire world to figure a lot of that out. The other project that's going on there is the research project for uh, doing view-dependent streaming, where the problem that we've got with panoramic video right now is that we only have about an eighth of the pixel resolution, the bandwidth for the video that we would like to have. We can do basically 4K video at 30 frames per second is what the hardware decoders handle. 
So we can divide that up a bunch of different ways. You can stretch it all around the panoramic view, and you get a 4K by 2K, 30 frames per second, monoscopic video, which looks pretty good. That's decent quality looking. It's not as high quality as like our really good 360 stills that are done with uh, the special time warp overlay la layer. But they look decent. But if you want to say, I want 60 frames per second for either moving while you're flying around along with something or because I've got near frame animation, then you get to cut it in half. And that's starting to look kind of blurry. Then if you say, well, I want stereoscopic, and it cuts it in half again, and that's starting to really, really hurt a lot. At the start, you're only at half the resolution of our peak quality uh, stills. Then you're at half again for 60 frames per second and half again for stereoscopic. Now, our best videos are 60 frames per second stereoscopic. And there's a tiny little bit of wiggle room in the codex where, like, if you encode them with no iframes, you can go a little bit higher resolution before the decoder chokes. But you're fighting over 20% here and there. It's not something that's going to make these multiple factors of two. So what we can do is say, for the most part, when you're looking forward, you see a 90 degree field of view. So if you treated it as a cube map, you're looking at exactly one sixth of the pixels. Now, obviously, you could just show that, then every little head twitch, you'd be seeing black at the edges of the screen. But there's a lot of different ways you can consider to say, well, we will make a projection so that most of the detail is concentrated in front and then less detail in the back. For some content, that might be sufficient all by itself. You set something up. If you've got a focus that you're only going to be looking at, maybe you only need blurry stuff there. If you look around, it's not going to look great. But if you're concentrating in the front and you just always see something, there's nothing to pull you out of the sense of virtual reality. But a lot of the stuff that you'd like to have does involve looking over. That is kind of the appeal of virtual reality, of exploring the rest of the world around you. So the trick there is to figure out how to change as you look around. So what we're doing right now is ingesting uh, a high quality video and then resampling it for 30 different views. So it's like here, 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 going around this, uh, you know, uh, point sampling the sphere around us. And then we could have it swap between those as you move around. And we're still working on protocol decisions about how much do you, uh, do you wind up buffering ahead, what are the group of picture sizes, and a lot of technical details. That's not ready for deployment yet, but we do have uh, some demos of this working where you can have a higher quality video than you've ever seen in, uh, in virtual reality as a, video, uh, as a video stream. And you can check where you flip around really fast, and it's blurry, and then it comes in in between one and two seconds. Uh, but to do this streaming, you would have to have, it will be closer to a video conferencing system than a traditional streaming system, where uh, Netflix actually buffers up to five minutes ahead of time. They will have this very large buffer so they can handle some fairly disastrous network hiccups uh, without destroying the video stream, unlike a, like a Skype call or uh, FaceTime, something like that, where every little glitch that you see causes some problem. So doing this view-dependent streaming, if you want it to respond quickly, it's going to have to be something like that. Uh, but I think that there's, you know, there's, a good, there's a good chance that we can make something that works pretty well for that. There's two things that it actually solves. There's the desire to go to, ever, to higher quality than we've ever seen before, uh, achieving better than what we've done on any of our side-loaded videos. And then there's wanting to achieve streaming within a reasonable amount of bandwidth. And that's one of those kind of broad customer questions about what's a reasonable amount of bandwidth. Uh, I think that I would say, what we've got on streaming right now for the current 360 videos is not great. I think that everybody looks at that and says, this is, this is a pretty big step down. I, a lot of people would say that the current resolutions that we had on the, stereo, uh, the stereoscopic and 60 frames per second videos was already re really marginal. And cutting the quality down even more is maybe just a step too far, and it destroys the value equation. So with the with the view-dependent stuff, we have the choice. We can either give four times higher quality uh, in terms of resolution, or we can take the same quality and do it in one quarter the bit rate, which in the larger scheme of things is probably going to be the more important. I mean, we love going to trade shows and loading up a special, uh, you know, a special system that has all of those views locally that could then deliver the peak quality of the animation, but that's not something that people are going to deliver. If you had 30 views of all of that, you could 
very quickly fill up 128 gig card. But one of the things that we were told as we joined Facebook is, assume you have infinite storage. So this is one of those that we say, all right, let's just take in gigantic videos that are all these 4K plus videos, and let's make 30 separate copies of them, and we'll just kind of jump between them. So that's an interesting and exciting direction in the, con in the media content side. One of the other things that goes from the kind of comes at that from another direction is the peak quality, the very best quality stuff that you can see in a headset. If you, you know, if you just want to say what is the the highest quality from a rendering, uh, kind of filtering pixel quality, and that's our uh, the stereoscopic stills that are in 360 photos. There's technical reasons why those look better than all of the other gaming things. The fact that it's sampled kind of before, right at the time of distortion, rather than distorting something that's already been sampled. So the Render the Metaverse contest with Otoy was, you know, was exciting for me, where one of the great things about this is we had done this, uh, the stereoscopic panoramic videos with Felix and Paul and some of these other companies that had done this manual stitch together approximation. But I was thinking that we don't have any static stills like that. I was happy to hear just yesterday that some people do have bodies of static uh, stereoscopic camera captures, so I'm excited to get some of those into our you know, real-world captures to get those into our, uh, our content library. But building them completely synthetically with the Octane uh, Ray Tracer is straightforward because you can just make a function and say, these are the angles that I want. And it's still a god-awful hack the way we do these stereoscopic panoramic visions, you know, where it's assuming that the stereo is correct when you're looking straight ahead, so everything further off to the side, the stereo is more and more wrong, and it assumes your view is always level, where if you ever turn your head, it's getting really wrong quick, and that's, that's not generally a comfortable thing to do very much at all. But again, it kind of works for most people. You put it on most people's heads, and they generally limit themselves to moving around like that. You know, you put it on a techie VR person's head, and you know, they'll, they'll do this and kind of uh, tease out the, where everything breaks down for it. But still, so generally it works, but we didn't have it's, you know, we didn't have a great capture method. But I laid out kind of what it was, like what the equations for all of these things would be. And uh, Jules at Otoy, basically, it was I think over a weekend where he generated a test image for those and sent back something that they had rendered with some of their stock content. And they have. They have some amazing content that they can't show publicly because it's from some of their uh, their private, uh, the media partners that they work with. Some just awesome, awesome stuff that I wish could be made publicly available. But once it got integrated into the their toolkit, then we set up the render the metaverse content uh, contest to let. My goal was to try to engage artists which is we're talking mostly to programmers. Generally, when I'm up here, I'm talking to the programmers and implementers that are going to work the engineering side of things. But uh, here we were with something that had an artist's tool as the primary interface to it. And I was excited to see what real artists would do. When you say, here's the technology, you're not messing with it all, you're pressing the button that says render to stereoscopic cube maps. What are you going to produce as an artist in this medium that really had never been done before? This panoramic composition is interesting, and quirky stereoscopic panorama is something that, as far as I know, nobody was making significant content like that. So it was interesting to throw this out and just see what people started doing with that. And I judged every single one of the issues. I, I felt I, I definitely did not feel really appropriate as an artistic judge for these things. But I went through every in, uh, every one of the entries that kind of met the criteria and came in, which was, you know, there were dozens each month, so it was maybe 150 or so through all of that. And I genu genuinely was inspired by seeing these things, where I would see these worlds that had. You know, beautiful senses of vision and composition, and I felt that it was a frozen slice from the future, where I'm looking around and the quality was so good, it just, I so wanted to be, I also wanted soundtracks. You know, I'm sitting in these things and I wanted to hear some background music or some, I, you know, voiceover going on, wind blowing, because they felt so real looking at them. And I wanted to walk down that hallway or look under the bridge or do these other steps. And eventually, we'll get there. We'll get there to the point where we're rendering equivalent quality in a dynamic way where we can do that. But I found it very valuable just looking at those things there and said, this is creative and artistic. And I'm moved on some level by the content that was created here. And it's, it's energizing to say, it's like, well, what do, we, what do we need to do to take the hardware to the level where we can start doing these things dynamically?
So we have, on the one hand, these super quality, statically rendered stills that are rendered natively to this 1536 cube map. And then we have our whole video streaming efforts, which is working around these codec limits about what can you do inside 4K 30 hertz video. Uh, Otoy did a kind of clever thing where they thought, well, we wish that we had this super quality, this peak quality uh, cube map for some kind of animation. And I had talked with them about stenciling, cutting out some things. So what if we just animate one face of the cube? We can do that at peak quality, but not have any, leave everything else static. And there's probably interesting things that can be done with that. But uh, the interesting thing that they did is they just rendered out a few hundred cube maps. And, uh, so you've got a few seconds of animation. And no video compression at all, just ASTC down to a bit and a half or something, and they load them all up. So it sits there and it fills up all of your, uh, all of your Samsung uh, GPU available memory with cube maps. But then they're just sitting there. They're all uh, available at any time. So you can hit the key and it plays through this short little uh, snippet of video, and I'm calling them VR vines in my head, where it's just a short couple second where it runs through, and I think they're, they're showing that at the show, it's pretty amazing to look at where you're sitting here and you're like, okay, peak quality cube map, this looks great, and then all the, the stuff runs by you, and you're like, wow, that was really something. But then the neat part is you could stop that because it's no forward decoding sort of video codec infrastructure. You can start and scrub back and forth, and you can have all of these uh, characters sitting here and then move backwards and forwards, and it totally feels like a superpower, like you're just master of time here. They're sitting there, and you're like forwards, backwards, you know, look over at what it's doing over there. So that's, again, a neat thing that there's no other sort of platform where that makes that makes the same sense. It's a novel use of media. And I think that there's a lot of these things where uh, in that same type of thing, if you've got 300 frames, what could you do interesting? You could make a, uh, like a Zen garden scene that has multiple loops that seamlessly uh, tile to each other. So you could have waving grass and animation and some roiling clouds. You could do interesting things inside this weird little media pocket. And there's another uh, aspect where some people have done some work with just, instead of panoramic stereo, which has all of these really significant problems, there's the quality issues about how it's only correct in the center, as you look around, more issues with that, and the, the pixel count is still a huge deal. I think we missed a little bit of an opportunity by not focusing more initially on wide angle stereo just right in front of you, because we've seen, you know, early on there were a couple companies that were doing 180 degree uh, panoramic stereo, and at first, I would be like, yeah, but you look back there, and it's just all black, and that kind of breaks it. But I've come around a lot on that, where a high-quality experience that can be presented with this better pixel fidelity, and it can have the stereo. When you're looking straight ahead, all of the pixels will be in correct stereo for that case. So in some ways, it's better. As you look more away from the center, eventually you'll see the edge, and the stereo will be more and more wrong as you turn your head away. But just moving your eyes across it, it will stay correct. And even more importantly is that the, uh, that becomes a trivial camera rig to both build, deploy, and edit the output from it. Editing panoramic video and stereoscopic panoramic video is a nightmare in a lot of ways. But two cameras that are just synced together, there's a ton that you can do with that. So I think that uh, I encourage people to be investi investigating more with other camera architectures. Even like a GoPro, if you take that view and you pre-distort, you undistort it correctly, it just barely covers the whole field of view. You know, you'll quickly see the edges as you move around, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for figuring out how to frame videos where you make a, you take a video source, whether it's a cylindrical panorama or a GoPro or a wide-angle stereo, and you figure out some uh, conceit that you can use to build geometry that hides the edges perfectly, where a lot of things that you're looking out over a reasonably wide angle view, you could make out the windshield of a vehicle or out the bay window of a house, uh, you know, or through a side view of something where we've got, uh, we've been talking to the, uh, the Space Needle people in Seattle where they have this time machine cylindrical panorama view that you can kind of look back through every 10 minutes for uh, you know, the last year or something and look at the different things. It's 
narrow view, so you can't look around everywhere. It's not a full panorama, but it's still neat content. So what I want to do there is like, let's build an HG Wells time machine with all the brass fittings and put it there so it frames that content. And then you can pull the levers and travel through time looking around it. I think there's a lot of interesting things like that that are easier to produce, lots of value from it, and can really play to the novelty of VR in many ways. So uh, that the plan six months ago when I was talking some of this was I figured we need some way to do simple things with media where we want to have a mesh for the GoPro camera and we want to be able to fade programmatically and play a voiceover and I you know, do a few minor things because what we've seen and it, it pains me as an engineer to see this when we see somebody building a media application that's basically drawing a video onto a globe and using unity for it and it works it's you know it lets you do certain things very nice and easily but pulling all of unity around to draw video is you know it just strikes me as wrong in the pit of my stomach as an engineer and we wanted some lightweight way of doing that so for a while, I was pursuing this little strategy of we were calling them experience files. The idea was that you were going to be able to sort of pick a, camp, pick a mesh for the scene that would have part of it as a screen mesh, and you'd be able to play that. So any camera that you want, you could build just the right little distortion mesh, and you could put whatever you want around it. And then you need some really basic timeline control for things. You need to be able to start a fade here and uh, start some audio here, do some trivial things. And that's a slippery slope that you start getting on, where you start off and saying, I've got a completely declarative data language, where here's models, here's screens, but I need a little bit of control. So I'll put in a timeline that'll define time points, but I want a tiny bit of interactivity, an if statement here, and all of a sudden you've designed a really crappy programming language. And this happens over and over through all, all sorts of industries, people that work with that. You wind up writing some uh, really lame extension language, and I've gone through this myself. I mean, Quake C back in the day was super important from a gaming standpoint about letting people do this, but it was a bad language because it was implemented just ad hoc as necessary. I said, I need this, I need this, I put this in, and it worked, but I feel kind of bad inflicting the semantics of some of that uh, on the people that did amazing things with it. People will persevere through the difficulties if it's cool enough, but with hindsight as an engineer, certainly something much better could be done. So I was a little bit wary about repeating that same mistake. I didn't want to, to just do something that was uh, enough for the media systems because I know people would push through, run into all the limits, and try and do greater things beyond that. And boy, I'm totally running out of time here before all the things I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> But to, well, let me segue quickly. So that's part of the lead into the VR script stuff, which I'm almost certainly not going to get to here. Uh, but to jump to the Netflix side of things, this was something that literally happened last month. Uh, we had talked to Netflix in the very early days of Gear VR, before it was released. I, you know, we talked with them, and they were interested, and they thought it sounded neat, but it was basically, you know, come back to us when you've got a few million users, which is a completely reasonable thing for a busy, successful company to say to a nascent platform. So uh, I had a list last year when I was thinking to myself, what do we need to make Gear VR and VR in general a very successful platform? You know, we just launched the Innovator Edition. There was very little software for it but if I could just write down what's important for this. And one of the things that at that time, Minecraft was very high on my list. It's like, I really want to get Minecraft. But on the video side of things, there's a number of branches of the video consumption tree that are all important. There's the uh, kind of free, random, short download, which you know, YouTube is the kind of the epitome of. But looking at that, we now have Vimeo, which is tons, it's an infinite, the bottomless well of content. And that's what we didn't have in VR, is it wasn't hard for people to go in and play every piece of content that you could get on VR. Download everything in the store, give it a try, and see what you think about it. And then you're done. Then the most fun thing to do with your VR is show it to your friends, which is, you know, which is fun, but that's, we want to have reasons why people keep putting in, you know, putting the headset back on every day. So... We hit that point with Vimeo in the upcoming releases where you've now got interesting videos of high quality that you can sit and watch as long as you want through there. We don't have an optimal interface for following through it, but work can continue to, to improve with that. Then 
you need something where you can download movies for watching on the airplanes or watching in places that have poor internet connectivity. I, you know, we're, we've got all of our studio deals that we're doing, we're trying to handle that ourselves. But the biggest one where most of the video would be consumed is you want something where you've got the paid subscription streaming service for official content. And uh, there's a number of possibilities. I would have I would have worked with whoever kind of came to me first, but Netflix was the top of the list. If somebody just says, what do we want on here? Well, you know, we'd like Netflix. That's the unsolicited comment that comes out of people's minds. They see Oculus Cinema and they say, well, can I get Netflix in this? And that just, that's verbatim from many people that we've heard going through this. So, I mean, I had actually had a Twitter exchange where somebody was inquiring about that. And I said, if Netflix is interested, I want to help. <laughs> and last month, Max, uh, Max got a hold of me and said that, well, we've got a meeting scheduled at Netflix, and it sounds like things are, are really positive. There have been conversations from Facebook and Netflix, and, and it sounds pretty good. Uh, would you come down from Dallas to, uh, to attend the meeting? I'm like, sure. So I flew in, we met at Netflix, and it was kind of funny. I was sitting out in the lobby for a while, and when we started the meeting, Anthony had said, yeah, I already got a message asking if that was John Carmack sitting out in the lobby, are we doing something with Oculus? <laughs> So you know, the meeting seemed to, you know, seemed to be going pretty well. We were talking about how we could use their, uh, their TV interface and maybe skin that into VR. And it's going along. I'm like, OK, let's do this. Grab an engineer. Let's go do this tomorrow. I will change my airplane flight. I will sit down, and we'll go make this happen. And uh, they didn't quite agree to do it tomorrow, <laughs> you know, the very following day. But the following week, we did have you know, two people from Netflix came down and camped in my office, and we started working on it. And by the, the second day, we had the Netflix UI uh, up and showing and look, looking really good, getting close on video. And I was really kind of hoping that in that two-day time frame that we would actually be able to play a movie. But, uh, you know, VJ, the engineer that was working with me, was really getting a little bit haggard at the end. And I was like, okay, got to go. We'll finish, it. we'll finish it remotely from there. And when they went out, Gloria peeked in and said, John, I think you broke the Netflix engineer. <laughs> but, but it was like one day. <laughs> you know, one day after he got back, he did get the first Netflix uh, test video playing on uh, Inside Gear VR. And it was maybe a week after that that they had the full uh, permissions and everything set up where you could start watching the real content. And uh, I, I literally did watch the entire season of Daredevil testing Gear VR, and it was, you know, it was great. In fact, I thought I, there was this little moment where I made a tweet about something about blind coders, and I'm thinking that's a little bit of an information leak. John's tweeting about blind operations because he's watching Daredevil because he's working on Netflix, I, but it. Uh, it pushed along super fast, and we were earlier this week. We were planning on releasing it at Connect. It's uh, the perfect way to do this, and there was a discussion of it doesn't even really need the beta tag. It's pretty damn good, so uh, it's going out. And I actually watched some yesterday morning in the hotel room here. I hope everybody uh, downloads it and checks it out because I'm pretty damn proud of getting all that done in a really short amount of time. So that was. <laughs> <laughs> So the clock says three minutes left. I, again, I will, they, they, they hope that I don't wind up distracting from the uh, attendance of the important technical sessions after this. You know, you should go to listen to Anuj and JP, but I am going to be around the rest of the day and this conversation will carry on through, you know, until everybody's gotten enough from all of it. Uh, but I want to at least touch on uh, VR script, which is, I am, you know, there's a lot of discussion internally about where we're going with this, but I was driven by two, okay, well, maybe I need to talk about social first, so I'm totally prioritizing here. So one of the other major things that I did this year was I started on a social infrastructure where one of the comments that I got that Jason Rubin on the content side would say, when he gives demos and talks to people, people understand how you're going to do gaming and video and content, but when you would talk to people, it, a lot of people just didn't get what social in VR meant. You're covered up in this headset, how can it be social? And we're waving our hands saying, but there will be avatars and VoIP and eye contact, and it'll do all of this stuff, but people didn't get it. It wasn't really sinking in. So uh, my pitch was, we need to just go do something and make it work. Now, we had already at that point had 
at least two, if not three, uh, avatar projects inside Oculus that have kind of gone up and not gone anywhere. It's a, a big rat hole when you start saying about what do you want for the whole anthropomorphic body. And my pitch was, I just want to do, first I was saying masks, like the old Oculus Connect demos, just the one in the mirror. I thought that would be sufficient. But some people said it was really kind of creepy, and we settled on just heads. So floating heads, but with really good eye, uh, eye movement, eye blinks, and high, uh, high quality, low latency VoIP. Uh, like one of the interesting things where, and lots of people have cobbled these things together. This is not some magical engineering things. A number of people in the audience have built similar systems. Uh, because I was focused on Android, I was able to actually drive all of the network traffic off of uh, the sound callback to minimize latency. So when, you, when the recording input comes in, it grabs the latest data stuff, uh, game state, and then sends off a UDP packet. So I actually built the, uh, the servers, the master server and the pastor packet server for that in Racket, which is a Lisp language that I'd been using for, for some development work. Because I had done a similar thing one year ago before Gear VR came out. I had started an avatar VoIP transport system. And I wrote that just like I wrote everything in C++. I would start it up, include WinSock. And I have, you know, I've railed against all of the services that should not be written in C or C++ just for software stability, code quality issues. And there I was doing the exact same thing. So I had resolved to myself that when I started this back up again, I was going to go write it in at least a memory safe language. And yeah, I'm running out of time here. So to go a few minutes over, and I promise I'll, I'll get off. <laughs> But <laughs> <laughs> so the pitch was, I needed to do something quick in social to make it happen, because we need a kernel that things are going to grow around. You know, it was not set out to design the perfect thing, which is what happens when you get too many people involved in a committee decision. So I did it all by myself. I went and I wrote the, the servers. I wrote the interface code to interface with our native applications. The first thing that I brought up was just, you're in a panoramic photo. You can look around at the other person and talk to them. But a lesson that we've learned and other people have learned many times is that a social VR chat room is almost without value. You do it once because it's interesting, but unless there's a kernel for the interactions to kind of focus on to grow around, it's not very interesting. Go and meet me in the empty panoramic room just doesn't have that much value. But we integrated it into our cinema, uh, Oculus Cinema at the time, as the ability to view synchronized movies, which we thought was going to be a great thing. You know, you go to the movies with someone, would you go to the movie with someone in virtual reality? And it, we got it all working from a streaming standpoint, getting it synchronized up, and that's fairly twitchy to get that, and probably still needs some additional work, but when you've got voice and people reacting to it and video streaming, you, know, you don't want somebody reacting to something before it actually happens on the other person's video. You want it synchronized within a second or so. But one thing that we did find, and it was interesting that Netflix uh, corroborated this, where watching dra dramatic content, a movie, with another avatar is just not actually that valuable. Netflix had done experiments on the Xbox 360 with their avatars and found this tiny fraction of people using it. But we poked around at some other things, and sporting content was another story where when you've got something going on, when you're expecting people to be cheering and moaning and reacting to what's going on in the screen, that has some value. So sports content, it'd be great to have I, you know, traditional mainstream sports, but perhaps even more interesting is eSports. And that's what led us to Twitch and getting that integrated. And the Twitch team has been great, hugely supportive about doing this, excited about the things that we're doing. And I'm excited about moving that to a whole nother level where right now we've got up to five people sitting in this local thing looking at that. But I'm excited over the next year, let's, like, let's work on arena scale sociability where we have potentially thousands of people interacting in some way, letting you maneuver amongst them and find local clicks and crowds that, uh, you know, that are inside your social graph or within steps removed from it. And that sort of being amongst the roar of the crowd as things are happening, I think that's very exciting and something that we can do a great job on in VR. And so I really probably need to cut this off, uh, but there is a ton more to talk about, and I will go till I'm hoarse uh, you know, through the rest of the conference. So thank you, everyone. Mm-hmm.